in this shot, we're walking you through the anatomy of a typical vertebrae. A typical vertebrae is formed by two main parts in this view. The, the vertebral body on the anterior side and vertebral arch on the posterior side. The vertebral arch on its side is being formed by the pedicle attaches to the body and lamina. Then here is the pedicle and lamina on this side as well. Between the vertebral body and vertebral arch, we have an opening or a foramen right there, vertebral foramen. Okay, now, um, we have a couple of processes associated with each vertebrae, um, the transverse processes on each side, one on each side, the spinous process in the midline that practically is formed by the union or fuse uh, laminae, okay? And then if I actually turn the vertebrae and look at on the lateral side, from lateral view, we have uh, the, the superior vertebral notch here above the pedicle, maybe on this side actually is more clear, right there. Superior vertebral notch and inferior vertebral notch. Okay, and also we can see the superior articular process here and inferior articular process. And each process um, actually has a, a smooth surface known as facet, articular facet, that in a second we will see that they articulate, they form the, actually the joint between two adjacent vertebrae. Okay, now I'm gonna actually put the two vertebrae on top of each other and here what we can see the, that hole, that opening between two adjacent vertebrae referred to as intervertebral foramen. Then practically the vertebral, vertebral arches, arches uh, notches actually, vertebral notches, they form the intervertebral foramen. In this shot, um, we are going to show you actually the, the spine and how the, the, the vertebrae articulates together. So let me, this is the part of the spine, of course, this is the cervical region. And then we have the lumbar region and the sacrum. So I'm going to turn the vertebrae, uh, the vertebral spine, we can see anatomical position. So as you can see, here is the opening between two adjacent vertebrae, intervertebral foramina right and also here we have the joint between the articular processes and also the space between the laminae between the laminae of the um, of the vertebrae okay now when we stack a vertebrae on top of each other we make the spine as you can see there is a metal rod right there so that is inside the canal the vertebral canal so then practically the, the vertebral foramina together when we stack the vertebrae on top of each other, they, they form a canal. And my probe and also that metal rod is inside the vertebral canal. Okay? Now, when it comes to the spine, good to know that we have seven vertebrae in the neck region. We call them cervical vertebrae. Then we have 12 vertebrae in the uh, thoracic region or upper back, thoracic vertebrae five in the lower back, lumbar vertebrae, and then five vertebrae that fuse together, they form a unique bone, sacrum. So we are gonna go through the sacrum um, later. Now, when we are looking at the vertebral column or a spinal column on the anterior view like this, or posterior view like that as you can see there is a straight line okay there is no deviation in the spine however on the lateral view as you can see we have the the curvatures along the vertebral column cervical curvature the thoracic curvature okay the lumbar curvature and the sacral curvature In this shot, we want to walk you through the anatomy of the typical cervical vertebrae. Here are the characteristics of the typical cervical vertebrae. Uh, one is um, the, the foramen or opening in the transverse process known as transverse foramen. 
one here and one there. Then the spinous process is uh, split or bifurcated, okay? And also, um, in some of the cervical vertebrae, we have a process on the superior aspect of the body of the vertebrae on the side, see that? And this is called oncus or oncinate process. The rest of the feature of a typical vertebrae can be seen in the cervical vertebrae as well, such as the body, the laminae, or pedicle, um, transverse process, um, so then there is no difference for that, and also we have the superior and articular processes, as well as the, the vertebral notches. We are looking at the first cervical vertebrae, also known as atlas, which is completely atypical cervical vertebrae because as you can see it doesn't have the body it doesn't have the lamina it doesn't have the the pedicle so that what it has um, is actually the two lateral masses one on each side the anterior and posterior arches it does have by the way the transverse process and opening in the transverse process it means transverse foramen is there okay now on the posterior surface of the anterior arch, as you can see, there is a small articular surface for a process of the second cervical vertebrae known as dense axis. So I'm going to actually bring the dense axis here. The second, this is the second cervical vertebrae. And as you can see, when they articulate together like that, so then dense axis articulates with the anterior arch. Then practically the rotational movements of the head happens at this joint the atlanto-axial joint. We are looking at the second cervical vertebrae known as axis. Okay, so the characteristics of this vertebrae, still transverse uh, process. Uh, we do have right there transverse process and you can see the transverse foramen in the transverse process right there. The spinous process is bifurcated okay and the rest we have the laminae uh, we have the pedicle and uh, but on the superior aspect of the bone uh, there is a process here known as dense access or odontoid process because it is like like a tooth tooth like process okay now on the bottom part we have the body here and then you can imagine the body here articulates with C3. So then practically the, the axis is um, atypical on the superior aspect, but typical on the inferior aspect. So practically the condyles of the occipital bone um, articulate with the superior aspect of the lateral masses, okay? Then what happens is, that when the occipital, and, and by the way, that joint is known as um, atlanto-occipital joint, that we have flexion, extension, and lateral flexion in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in those joints. And then when I, I articulate with the atlas with the axis like that, now you can imagine the head with the atlas turns around the dense axis. Then we have the rotational movements in the atlanto-axial joint. We are looking at the seventh cervical vertebrae, and as you can see, the spinous process is not bifurcated, and 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 also we do have the oncinate process processes on each side of the superior aspect of the body. In this shot, we are looking at a typical thoracic vertebrae. So you can imagine that in the thoracic region, because we have the ribs on the sides, right, then we should have articular surfaces on some parts of the thoracic vertebrae. And uh, practically, those articular surfaces are on the sides of the body. So as you can see on the side of the body, we have kind of the hemi, um, or half of the articular facet on the sides, on the top and the bottom part, okay? And then th we have articular surface or facet on the transverse process, okay? These are the characteristics of the thoracic um, vertebrae.
Now, when I articulate the two, thora two adjacent thoracic vertebrae together like this, now you can imagine that those um, um, semi or, or um, hemi-articular facets together, they form, uh, they form a full facet. And I'm going to put the, the, the rib here. So let me turn like that and then zoom out. Okay, and here it is, here what happens. See the head, head of the rib articulates with the sides of the bodies, and then there is articular surface on the rib here, right there, and that articulates with the, um, with the transverse process. Okay, this is the way that the rib articulates with the thoracic vertebrae. good to know that the features that we see on the thoracic vertebrae um, are not in all the thoracic vertebrae. For example, that is T1. As you can see, there is a full facet on the side of the body. Okay. And also that is um, um, T12 or even T11. Uh, what I can see is a full facet on the side of the body. Even that is on the pedicle, not even, even on, the, on the body. Then practically T1, T9, 11, um, actually T1, T9, 10, 11, 12, or atypical thoracic vertebrae. Okay, let's go with the feature of a typical rib. Rib or costa or costo is like a twisted uh, flat bone, okay? So uh, from posterior to anterior, it has the head right here. Then we have the neck. Then we have a part known as tubercle right here. Let me turn that right here. That articulates with the transverse process of thoracic vertebrae. Then we have the shaft or body. But then the area of the shaft here right there after the tubercle, that is called angle. Okay? Now, on the inner surface of the shaft, I can turn this like that, and the inner surface right there, we have a groove known as costal groove that contains the intercostal vein, vein artery nerve. And then on the anterior end, right there, that part actually joins to the, or attaches to the costal cartilage. The head of the rib has two small facets, uh, one on one on this side and one on this side, and a, a, and is a, like a, a crust between. And what happens is when uh, we articulate these with the bodies of the thoracic vertebrae, like this, and as you can see, each hemifacet articulates with the sides of the body of the thoracic vertebrae, like that, and the transverse process of the thoracic vertebrae with the um, tubercle of the of the rib. Okay, uh, we are looking at the um, sacrum, which is the bone um, is a um, triangular wedge-shaped bone made by the fusion of uh, or fuse five sacral vertebrae. Okay. So that triangular bone um, has the anterior surface right here. Then it has the posterior surface right there. And this is the base of the sacrum and the base of the sacrum. And here is the apex of the sacrum. So let's go with different parts of the sacrum on the anterior aspect. Right here is the anterior border of S1 or the first uh, sacral vertebrae known as promontory. Then on the side, we have ala, or wing of the sacrum. We also have the opening between the sacral vertebrae on the anterior side, known as anterior sacral foramina. And you can imagine that sacral nerves pass through the, these openings. And then on the side of the bone, we have an articular surface, looks like ear, hence auricular surface that articulates with the ilum of the hip bone to form the sacroiliac joint 
and then on the posterior side or posterior aspect we have the posterior sacral foramina and also um, some sacral crests like this like this like this sacral crests which are the remnant of the fused spinous processes of the sacral vertebrae or articular processes or transverse processes now when we go down here okay at the tip of the sacrum as you can see the laminae of s5 do not fuse together and they form an opening here known as sacral hiatus sacral hiatus and this hiatus actually is filled by a piece of uh, um, soft tissue in um, living person or in life that sacral hiatus actually is connected to the sacral canal so then you can imagine the sacral canal is the canal inside the sacrum right there In this shot, we want to walk you through the, the anatomy of the, of the sternum or chest bone. So as you can see, the sternum looks like a dagger. It has a handle known as manubrium, the body, and the tip of the dagger known as xiphoid process. Okay? On the superior sur surface of the manubrium, right there, we have uh, a notch, suprasternal notch or jugular notch, which is the surface anatomy landmark. On the sides, we have articular facets for, or surfaces for clavicle. And then on the side of the manubrium, we have articular surfaces for rib one and half of the rib two. And I will tell you what it means, half of the rib two. This part um, that is the junction of the manubrium and the body is known as sternal angle sternal angle of Louis. okay so by the way this this is the, this is in this sternum they are separated these two are separated okay so if i actually turn uh the manubrium to the side you can see there's a full facet for rib one and this is half of the articular surface for uh rib two then practically at the sternal angle the head of the rib two the anterior border of rib two not head the anterior um uh, um, end of the rib to um, articulates. Okay, then that is a bony landmark, uh, sternal angle. Um, it, is, it is kind of prominent in individuals. And by palpating your sternal angle, you can find the rib two, and then you can start to count the ribs from that part. On the sides of the body, we have articular surfaces um, for the the uh, costal cartilages. Okay, and good to know that the xiphoid process could be different shape in different individuals. In this shot, we want to walk you through the other classification of the ribs known as true and false ribs. The upper seven ribs are known as true ribs, whereas the lower five ribs are known as false ribs. However, the rib 12 and 11 uh, because they do not articulate with anything on the anterior side. They are known as floating ribs. Now, um, these uh, small brown structures here um, are practically representing the costal cartilages. The costal cartilages are um, small pieces of cartilage that attach the ribs to the sternum. Now, as you can see, the upper seven ribs articulate directly via their own costal cartilage to a stenum, whereas rib um, 10, 9, and 8, they articulate to the stenum with the costal cartilages of rib 7. Now, the costal cartilages of rib 7 to 10, they form a, um, a border here known as costal margin or costal border. In this shot, we want to walk you through the, through the chest cavity. So as you recall, the chest cavity is formed by the sternum on the anterior side, okay? 12 ribs on the sides and 12 thoracic vertebrae on the posterior side. 
okay we have a spaces between the ribs known as intercostal spaces spaces which is filled by intercostal muscles and intercostal band good to know uh, that right here there is a normal variation which is really interesting that rib one two three four the rib four is bifurcated on the anterior side that is absolutely normal variation it shouldn't be it should be like the other ribs here so anyway so then that this chest cavity okay it has uh, two openings one on the uh, superior side right there known as superior thoracic aperture and one on the inferior side right here the inferior thoracic aperture as you can see the inferior thoracic aperture is is formed by the xiphoid process of the sternum on the anterior side costal margins on the sides rib 11 12 on the sides and then the t12 on the posterior side this opening is sealed by diaphragm whereas the superior aperture which is right here oh we can see perfectly here um, is bounded by the jugular notch of the sternum on the anterior side rib one please ignore the clavicles okay ignore the clavicles rib one on the sides and t1 on the posterior side this aperture the superior thoracic aperture is open and is not sealed by any particular muscle